This is the fun part. Everything else was warm up. I hope you're ready. There's a saying in sales that nothing attracts clients like passion. You know, that P word, passion. Well, I got to warn you, there's a lot of passion up here right now with these three folks. So you better brace for impact with your passion meters because you're going to get a good dose of it. But I'm delighted to uh, open this panel on overcoming barriers to dietary change, which is the first of two panels that we'll have. And what we're going to focus on here is really individuals, people. So it sort of builds on the last talk. How do you sort of translate that thought, that desire, or even develop that desire and get it into an action as far as getting people to shift that needle towards more plant-based thinking and foods and, and health? Um, and the way this panel will work is I'm going to introduce our three illustrious participants and they're going to say a few words about um, some of their interests. We'll have some questions for them and then hopefully a little time for questions from you at the end. And I know you can ask tough questions because you've been doing it all day. So you'll keep that up. All right. So uh, what I'm going to who I'm going to introduce first, let's see, Merrilis is closest to me, and you can read the full description in the program, but Merrilis on your right is a community chef, organizer, food educator, and enterprise manager at Just Foods. And her work centers on racial equality, equity, food sovereignty, through a decolonizing of your diet, and someday I will be smart enough to understand what all that means, but it sounds really important, I gotta say that. <laughs> as well as solidarity and cooperative economy lens. She currently works with parents and works on uh, getting better food, particularly in Dominican restaurants as an interest. Uh, mm. There is a, uh, a restaurant that you work with, I guess is Mama Catalina. Yeah, that's my parents. In Queens, uh, named after her paternal grandmother, mm -hmm. and uh, she also has a BA in International Studies from CCNY and is a native New Yorker but has roots in the Dominican Republic. So, uh, Marilise, why don't you start by uh, just giving us a few words of um, your thoughts on this whole, um, your, your experience, your perspectives on getting individuals to change and embrace mm -hmm. a healthier way of eating and lifestyle. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, so my experience, I am a community chef, uh, in other words, like the people's chef. And with my background, I've done, I've partnered with different community gardens uh, in New York City, but specifically one in the Bronx called Kelly Street Community Garden. And there throughout the season, throughout the summer, we would do, I would do cooking demonstrations for community members um, where we harvested the ingredients that were grown in the garden and we would make a recipe that would be culturally connected to the demographic of the, of the community. So within the work that I have, my background is, I really like to make dishes that are culturally relevant to the people that I'm working with. So I've worked a lot with the Spanish-speaking community, um, the Latinx heritage community, and Afro-Caribbean cuisine is, is my expertise, I would say, and bringing, bringing that Afro-Caribbean uh, cultural dishes and giving it a plant-based spin to it. Um, or just making dishes that are Afro-Caribbean that's already plant-based. So kind of reminding our people that this is already inher inherently knowledge that we have within us. So like I am of Dominican descent and we make okra and we make eggplants, stew eggplants. So it's just telling my people that this is already something that we've done. Let's use those the, the sazon, the flavors, um, in, like which is red peppers, onions, garlic, and that is the base of whatever it is that you're making. So um, that's a little, that's my background. And within the work that I do with Just Food too, um, we support other people that are interested in being food educators from the community. So it may be, for example, so um, 
If you have um, like Somos that works with different health clinics throughout New York City, maybe your patients want to be a food educator and like Just Food will support um, people to be able to do that um, and be educators in their communities and so that you can see more representation sharing this knowledge that's already within us. So that's uh, a little bit, I, I can continue, but I know we have other people on the panel, so. No, that's perfect, thank you. Yes. So. <laughs> So I know you just had lunch and a break, but I don't know what that sasson. I'm ready for more. I don't know about <laughs> you. Bring on the sasson. We're going to all be going to Queens to the restaurant for dinner after this, I think. Hope they can hold 200 people. Um, let's move now to uh, uh, our center, uh, Diego Poniman. Uh, Diego is the chief medical officer at SOMOS, that's capital S-O-M-O-S, -O -O Community Care. He was born and raised in Buenos Aires, where he also uh, completed medical school, then did his residency in the Bronx at Einstein, uh, and later a fellowship in general internal medicine at Sinai. He's uh, a primary care physician, has a private practice uh, at Metropolis Medical in Upper Manhattan, and he uses nutrition and lifestyle changes as therapy for his patients. He's currently working with the SOMOS community care and underserved communities through local clinics, and he is bringing food oases to uh, uh, the communities with hope to transform uh, the so-called food deserts into healthier neighborhoods. So, Diego, if you would share your thoughts on uh, barriers in your experience. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. So, as Rich says, I'm a primary care physician, which is a family doctor, basically, and uh, I in a group with SOMOS, which means we are in Spanish, we're about 2,500 physicians, and we describe ourselves as the neighborhood physicians. We are mostly immigrants. We are mostly Latinos, I have to say. We're in Washington Heights, in Harlem, in the Bronx. Uh, we're in Brooklyn as well, for, as well, as well in four boroughs. And uh, one of the things that we see, and personally I've been doing I love and I really enjoy, and it's very rewarding to treat patients with food therapy, with, for basically use food as medicine. But since November, what we got is we got the opportunity to start a bigger program in which we get about 40 patients and we walk them through 10 days of plant-based nutrition. As you, as you know, or you might uh, imagine, our patient population comes usually from Latin America, and usually rural areas, and they get to the United States, they get acculturated, and as they get acculturated, the health starts going down. They can identify that. They add the cheeseburgers, and they add the pizzas, and the cheese, and you can see their health. And what they used to eat in the rural areas was basically rice and beans. And, you know, occasionally, for festivities, for some, you know, they, they could do meat as well, some fish, but basically their main, and now they come to the United States and they come to my office and they say that the problem is the rice and the problem is the corn, I mean the plain corn. And that, that I have to, so we have to, as you know, Eric you know, pointed this morning, I have to change, you know, they're switched, you know, start the hard drive and start to telling them that basically the rice, the better, of course, I tell them to do brown rice and the beans. So that's, that's our job, to start educating again. But we have the luxury of giving them 10 days. Like Dr. Gregor says, it's a free sample. We give them 10 days, people start feeling better. People start, it's a, it's a miracle, I have to tell you. People tell me that chest pain goes away and diabetes get normalized and you know everything. And for us, that our goal is to keep patients out of the emergency department. We try, that's what we give appointments, easy appointments, easy access, that's what we have as staff. We want people to get their primary care in the primary care offices with the family doctors and not in the ED. That's our goal. So that this goes perfectly aligned with what we try to do. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> And our uh, anchor man for the introductions, uh, Omawali Adawali, who I hear completely lacks all passion and enthusiasm for his uh, material, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, but Omawali is the author of an introduction to veganism and agricultural uh, globalism. Don't mess with him. He's a former champion fighter. Uh, 
<laughs> as well as a uh, research scholar for the Manhattan Research Library Institute. He's uh, 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 certified in plant-based nutrition. He is in production of Brother, B-R-O-T-H-A, Vegan for Lantern Books, <laughs> uh, a collection of insightful essays and stories and others for black vegan men. These are writings by black vegan men. Um, he's the co-founder of GAME, a not-for-profit that looks at socioeconomic issues among working class people of color. And he's also the founder of Black VegFest, which sounds really cool. I think we'll all have to go. Thank you. And of course, Omawale was born right here at SUNY Downstate Medical Center. So um, it's nice to have you back. Yeah. Omawale, your thoughts on barriers to change and successful ways to deal with them? Oh my goodness, uh, there's so much. Let's try to make this short, right? Okay, so, all right, uh, so I got five minutes, I think. Um, so first, and I'm gonna try to keep it really, really um, brief. Uh, Black Veg Fest, uh, we wanted to uh, address uh, the community's health decline and also um, my passion, you know, for animals. And how does that actually work, right? Um, and, 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 and it's not that uh, the black community has issues with animals, right? Because sometimes we talk about veganism in such a way and, and, and it's defined as this, you know, um, this white thing, right? So we kind of demystify a, a lot of that and and we try to make that clear that people are really suffering from, you know, housing discrimination just housing access, you know, unemployment, underemployment. So when you have all those things stacked up to you, stacked up against you, and uh, in addition to police brutality, I've been stopped by, you know, the police for so, so long, and I speak to people all the time, and I'm like, I can't believe it. Police haven't stopped me in like a year or so, and it's like, it's like so redefining of your life, like, wow, like this is a little bit of what freedom might feel like. So just kind of just feel that, because it resonates with me, right? So we're dealing with all those issues, and so when we look at the landscape in terms of, you know, oppression, you know, and we're talking about food, like people are dealing with this issue, like they don't want to hear about who else is oppressed. You understand? So um, we try to make them understand that, and that's where intersectionality comes, comes in, comes into play, and why it's so significant. So when we do Black Veg Fest, we organize you know, incredible speakers, um, the vendors, uh, and we really try to take on all the different issues that are out there, but not by ourselves. We just organize people, and that's what the organizer does, and that's what we you know, essentially try to do is, you know, uh, so we take the information and what we want to do is we connect that with, we get the information from the researchers and we connect that to the people. Like yesterday, Black Veg Fest went into Brevoort Housing for the third time. We're doing monthly um, conversations with seniors. And so the seniors, they get this information. We, you know, you know, we talk about, you know, hummus and why is, you know, folks, you know, utilizing hummus. But then also we want to talk about, you know, even things in, uh, in breakfast foods like pancakes yesterday, no eggs and no dairy. I, I, you know, I love, you know, pancakes. So just to be clear, these are things that I know how to cook and, you know, and create and that I love, right? So when I go to the elders yesterday and the elders are like, yeah, pancakes, I was like surprised. I'm like, oh, I'm going to have a lot of fun. So they love, you know, blueberry, you know, banana pancakes, you know, go figure, right? With no eggs and no dairy, and it tastes the, um, it tastes the same as if they would get it from somewhere else. And we make it palatable, the information palatable, but also the resources, the recipes, and everything easy. If we have to go right to the door, that's what we do. That's what community organizers essentially do. And I think that's what folks up here, you know, uh, you know do. I think this is what this panel is about. And we want to connect you, you know, folks who are the professionals, um, also the you know attendees, how to actually engage, how to be a, a part of this, but also how to take your expertise and connect it to the people who need it. That's the um, that's the um, the true strength of the organizer, and that we do this work, you know, for no with no accolades. We do this work. Like yesterday, I had to go to the grocery store, and I was you know, and and, and the best the the best uh, conversation that I had was you know that it was two elders in there that were um, you know getting ready to you know to meet me for this conversation yesterday, you know, and they said, oh, that's him, you know, it's like you know, like, oh, awesome, you know, um, you know, your your, um, your vegan chef is essentially you know your celebrity in the community, you know, so that's a good feeling. Um, I don't know, maybe my, it's not working, you know, but it said I had a, mi a minute, 
<laughs> so he did forewarn everyone. So uh, thank you very much. My name is Omar Wale. <laughs> Ah, it's that lack of passion, gets them every time. <laughs> Second time I heard the word intersectionality today. It's really sinking in. All right, now we got some tough questions for the panelists. Uh, mm -hmm. We're going to spare no mercy here at all. So, Marilis, you are first. And the question is, see, they're all waiting. You know, like, what's the question going to be? You know, get the question out. So, how can people get whole foods, fresh fruits, uh, vegetables, and other things in communities where it might not be so easy to get them, and it might be easier to go to your local Popeyes or churches or uh, McDonald's mm -hmm. or some healthy food stop like that. Your thoughts? Not that that would represent Central Brooklyn at all or the other boroughs, but mm -hmm. if it did, go ahead. Yeah, so this is a, a really great question. Um, I know that for Many people that do research will call certain community, communities that don't have access to nutritious and affordable fresh foods as food deserts. And I usually prefer to use the term food apartheid to describe really what, what it is that we're that people that live in uh, communities that lack that access to nutritious and affordable fresh foods. Um, and this term is a term that I've heard um, food advocates like Karen Washington, um, as well as Leah Peniman, who is a, a mentor to me. Um, they've used this term, food apartheid. And food apartheid, what that means is it makes it clear that this is a human-created system of segregation when it comes to food access. Um, that this is something that is not by accident as I mean I feel like most of you would know like know that like why is it that certain communities particularly communities of color you'll see have a higher higher rates of obesity um, high cholesterol and that is not something that is by accident um, you, you'll see that in community white neighborhoods they have four times um, more supermarkets than in black or you know, POC communities, uh, communities of color. Um, so that's just to, to say like this is something that um, is human created and to say food desert, it also says that you don't have access to food. And you know, there are these communities, the, the communities that I'm also a part of is like we may have, we do have a supermarket, we do have some access. So acknowledging that, that it's not completely, it's not completely a food desert, um, it's, it's food apartheid. Um, so, I would say uh, ways to bring in access to whole foods, to uh, fresh, nutritious foods um, that are culturally relevant um, is, well, one of those ways is, so here in Brooklyn, for example, the Brooklyn Movement Center and amongst other organizations are working towards getting a food co-op, um, similar to Park Slope Food Co-op. So that is something that is in the works right now and that is a way of like having community members come together and have a cooperatively like a co-op led uh food cooperative where you can source your ingredients and then have it be sourced partnering with local farmers and lo local gardeners to be able to source those ingredients. So that's like one example that's happening right now as a way to address wanting to bring access to whole foods and nutritious fresh foods in the neighborhood um, that is happening in the moment. Also, being able to have jobs is a way. So like community chefs, I feel like are really paving a way where where it's like we are doing the food education in our communities on the grounds, and we are also being able to um, make money as well by organizations partnering with organizations. So like I've also previously, um, I was part of Woke Foods. I was one of the worker owners of Woke Foods, and Woke Foods is a uh, Afro-Caribbean, Afro-Dominican, um, Co worker owned cooperative where it's using culturally relevant foods and being able to do catering and also being able to do cooking classes and then you can maybe charge um, like through catering you'll make some money coming in so having people in the community also feel empowered to start their own businesses to feel empowered that 
they, they, the knowledge that you have of cooking, that that is knowledge that you can build up upon and maybe also do food education, partner with organizations. When I was part of Woke Foods, we had the opportunity to partner with an organization called Chishama that works with uh, artists. And they considered, you know, we are culinary artists, community chefs, and they hired us to do demos inside the buildings, apartment buildings, and we would do the we would do demos in the lobby. Um, so that's just like a way also to bringing access to, um, to our people. Um, and then I'll do a shout out also to like Community Chefs Kitchen, which is a co-op that's also starting out for community chefs. Um, and they work with schools, they work with organizations like Rise Borough um, that are doing bilingual programming, cooking classes for people to also have access to this knowledge and access to just where, because community chefs also bring that knowledge of where can you source your ingredients and um, be as a, a guide you through this process. So just, so those are just some, some ways, recommendation, tangible ways that people can bring in um, access to whole foods, plant-based lifestyle um, in a tangible way. So that's just a few I, I'm sure that. My colleagues will yeah. share other things as well. Well, actually, your colleagues don't have time to share anything now. But uh, what I, what just I wanted so you to don't think I'm being mean, we had a conference call, and I told them exactly how much time they had. <laughs> all right? So I'm not a meanie. No, I'm he's not. A not. Meanie. We just there like was going to gonna be a, a one-minute thing after each, but we're going to hold off on what that I, for time. What so. I wanted to add is that you know, there's a myth out there that the only way to eat healthy no, is no, no, eating. We don't have time to oh. do okay, just feedback on this now. We'll, we'll fit it in later. Okay. But um, I, I really want to make sure we get to the questions for you guys, and you can contemplate food apartheid and intersectionality and all those things as we hear from. We're going to mix it up a little bit, Omawali. So the question for you, Omawali, is what particular barriers are there for African-American black individuals who want to add more plant foods to their diet? Awesome. Uh, great, great question. Uh, so. Well, first, uh, let's understand that when we talk about information and that's, you know, that, that, that's coming out, uh, whether we talk about in, in schools or we're talking about in uh, communities where folks work, uh, a lot of times we don't have access to that type of information. Uh, a lot of times we don't have that in, in, in school. If we look, we talk about our schools right now, like people just don't listen, right? Uh, if we say that particular foods that are, um, that are not healthy uh, within schools, uh, we have to create an organization, Coalition for Healthy uh, Schools, right, uh, in order to make that happen in, uh, in, in poor communities. And we have to, because I participated, you know, as a, as a speaker uh, or a presenter at these different uh, schools, and they just don't, they really just don't listen a lot of times, and it's the same time, some, and I guess it's a, a great place, so sometimes you go to a medical office, and what happens? Your doctor might not actually listen, mm -hmm. you know, to you. And sometimes, uh, and, and very often in our community, you know, we're not listened to, you know, whether we talk about even in terms of uh, work. So it's really from, it, it has to be a bottom up. It's not going to be just specific to, uh, you know, foods. It's everything, you know, we're not, we're not being listened to. Uh, for instance, you know, uh, we could be talking about issues, you know, uh, with, the, uh, with the police and uh, something could be happening, you know, on the road. Oh, I just had a um, roadside emergency in a situation and then a person would be killed. Not listening. You know, um, it's different examples. I was, uh, you know, I lived in the Bronx for 10 years and um, it was just awful in terms of, um, you know, the food apartheid, as Mary Lisa had said, uh, because being, I was being vegetarian for the, the entire time, I could not find anything. You, what you had at 161 in Grand Concourse in that area, you had Yankee Stadium over there, you have, um, you, you have Borough Hall over there, Bronx Borough Hall, you have uh, Supreme Court. Uh, you, you have family court, you have Bronx, you know, uh, criminal court, and you have all these different Asian agencies, uh, municipalities around there, and nothing but 
fast food, you know, um, the, the, the most uh, horrible access, you know, to resources. So I would ask when I would go to certain stores, bodegas, corner stores all the time, hey, is there any plant milks, any rice milk or almond milk? I'm talking about like 15 years ago. I'm talking about even, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, it, it, I, don't, I hope it's, you know, improved. I'm, you know, I'm back in Brooklyn. Um, and I would ask and speak to the, the manager and they would totally ignore what happened now? Now that's changed. Why? Because of gentrification. Mm -hmm. Not listening to the community. Mm -hmm. Just stepping out of the way. Sometimes all we really need, you know, in, in the black community, uh, communities of color, is just like, can we have the same access? Right. You know, just kind of step out of the way and uh, allow us to kind of, you know, just grow. If you just, you know, if you just get out of the way sometimes, like, people can really grow. It's, there's not, like, special access. And people think that we're asking for that. Like, with Black Veg Fest, there were uh, um, businesses um, that, I'm a rapper right now. <laughs> that, there were businesses that, that thrived, that made thousands that day because the black community, you know, um, depended upon itself. And then they did very well. And they will, you know, uh, uh, and, and continue to excel as we talk about real issues and we discuss race, you know, inside of our food. And we d discuss, um, you know, um, different cultures within our food. Once we do that and we have a conversation and we sit down and we talk about what's available and what's the resource and we start listening, then we can make, um, like, drastic changes. You know, that's been shown. Thanks. Yeah, that's what we want, the drastic changes. And I think we'll move now to Diego. And the question for Diego, we, we saved you for last because it's the toughest question, is, you know, for people who want to go plant-based, um, how do you ensure it's healthy? You know, as someone said before, you could eat white bread, jelly, and uh, uh, I guess an Oreo cookie sandwich and call it plant-based you know, diet, but it's not, mm -hmm. you know, how do you get the good carbs, the whole foods, stay away from the junk, and particularly in low-income and Latino, you know, underserved areas? Yeah, and I think that's, I found that's the most difficult, you know, in the 80s, I remember when people started, because again, they were saying that these zones, then they became in the 90s the blue zones. But even before, they realized that places in the world where people mostly live on carbs, they were the healthier populations. 80% carbs, the Okinawans. 80% sweet potatoes, the Okinawans. So they said less fat and more carbs, and people started doing refined carbs. Carbs that they were taking the nutrients, the fiber. And uh, I, what I tell my patient, because years ago, we didn't have the possibility of being in front of a computer, we had to bring, I don't know, things to, to show, flyers. Now I get in my computer and I put pastry and I just Google images, boom. And then you cannot try later, pastry. And you can get, tans then my patients say, I get it, I get it now, that's what I shouldn't eat. <laughs> so again, carbs mean, you know, unrefined, complex carbs, carbs that are not being processed. So again, quinoa, rice, camu, uh, corn, but not cornmeal, because cornmeal is great, but then you have to add the milk, the fat, the butter. So again, that's my daily fight. They come from, even from the endocrinology, saying that they should limit the amount of rice and the amount of corn. And I, you know, I become really, you know, frustrated because the idea is to do grains, but I tell them just like they grow from the garden and then you can peel it or cook it and that's fine. That doesn't mean French fries. That doesn't mean, uh, again, the cereal that you can get in the, in the store. So people, they, they get it. And again, when you put them on this immersion programs, 10 days, and all the, the only thing you give them is unprocessed food. You give them whole grains for 10 days, fruits, vegetables, and legumes. And you, they see their biomarkers. They see they lose like six to 10 pounds. They see that their chest pain, again, goes away. They see that they start breathing. They can take out the oxygen. I mean, again, a miracle. I've never seen anything like that. Then they start believing. But again, education and we, as uh, you know, physicians, need to get, again, remember, that's an, everybody knows that so we get such very limited 
uh, amount of you know, nutrition classes, nutrition education in medical school, almost none, zero. So, but now the fact that here, there, I, I've heard there are students, so that's, that's great. Now, you know, Michelle McMadden giving you know, lectures and Dr. Oswald as well in Montefiore, that's, that's changing, so that's great. So the future generations, they're gonna be better, I think. Diego, can you also just comment on the Latino community in particular? I know when I travel, if I go to Puerto Rico or Mexico, there's a lot of gorditos down there. There's a lot of people gaining weight. It's really more of an even epidemic than the U.S., if that's possible. You know, there's only so much dulce de leche you can eat and stay, you know, uh, a certain size. So what are the challenges in those communities? The challenges, the more they adapt, the more they adopt, the standard American diet, the far they go away from the foods that their grandmother used to cook, I mean, the worse you can see, and, and that's something that we always, you know, in fact, there's something called the Latino paradox. You know, the Latino paradox talks about even the worst socioeconomic, you know, numbers for Latinos in the US, they, if you compare mortality with our group, they don't do bad. Now, this is for the generations that migrate. First they thought it was only healthy Latinos come to the US. No, that's not true. Then they thought the Latinos go to die in Dominica. That's not true, they die here as well. Is that there's something in the food? Is the beans? Is the music? Is all the things that, you know, the social support. Now, the newer generation are losing that Latino paradox. So that's very sad. You see, the newer generation is the first one. Everybody knows that they're gonna live less than their, their parents. This is new. So I think that it's the acculturation that is killing us here in this country. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd like to give our panelists the opportunity to comment on anything their co-panelists said. So Merylis, you have a minute or two of thoughts on what uh, Diego or Omawali mm -hmm. just said. Yeah, so I want to speak a little bit about um, what Diego was just talking about within um, the Latinx community, and I know Richard, you had mentioned about like in Puerto Rico, you'll see a lot of people that are are heavier, and um, like I can just speak up about Puerto Rico specifically is that in Puerto Rico, there's such a high rate of uh, processed foods that is available to the people, and a lot of fast food restaurants. And it's you think about it, it's like they're in the Caribbean. You know, you can grow so much. So I, there are people now that are people that have been growing food, and there are more people that are after um, Hurricane Maria that are really trying to re reclaim this, this skill of, of being able to grow your own food, because that is something that is um, influencing why people are getting sicker, um, like in places like in Puerto Rico, um, and uh, that, that is something that needs to be addressed, getting people to reconnect with the land and people to be able to reconnect and, and see be part of that process of growing your foods um, because then there, you can decrease those mortality rates um, and those diet-related conditions. Um, so yeah, I wanted to, Great. to add that. Need some rooftop gardens in Brooklyn and got to get it going. And rooftop gardens. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, the more people connect with what mm -hmm. food really is, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, Omawali, your thoughts? Yes, uh, well, we was talking about uh, <clears throat> increasing uh, access or better access, uh, and Mary Lisa was uh, speaking to some things. I would also uh, would like to add, and I know she had brought up um, gardens, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and just being able to create your own uh, as much as you uh, possibly can. Uh, just having better, um, just better uh, innovative uh, models mm -hmm. uh, to, um, to, to basically model after, and uh, in terms of creating our own types of uh, food. Uh, our own types of, uh, you know, access to food. Uh, we had to create that. In order to go into um, Brevoid Housing, no one uh, tapped us on the shoulder. You know, we wanted to con contact them and, and find out that would they be uh, receptive to, you know, a plant-based or vegan, um, you know, message. And of course they are. And you just have to be consistent, you know, with that message. Uh, I think kind of the messaging, you know, today and, 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 and some of the panels is that, you know, veganism is, 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 is bad. But um, like the thing about, uh, you know, educate, H education is a consistent model. Like, like we don't want to do Black Veg Fest, you know, have one event and then that's it. Mm -hmm. Like, 
that's the problem. I do a lot of different veg fests, and it's like you might hear something, I might say something, or another um, educator might say something, and you'll forget it, right? It happens all the time. Mm -hmm. But if it's consistent, if it's also in, in stu institutionalized, mm -hmm. you know, then we do a lot better with that. But I think we have to begin, you know, creating and kind of, you know, uh, moving outside of the box. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Diego, you get the last word here. I know you were going to say something about Merelisa's um, ideas. Yeah, so, I mean, I, the myth I was going to say about whole food, a patient of mine calls food, whole check because the whole check goes when they go <laughs> to whole food. But, but uh, the idea is that we do, what, part of the things that we do on this Jumpstart, on this immersion program, we do tours to different and I have to tell you that any supermarket has, and I was once trying to discuss how to cook beans with my Dominican, and they almost, you know, kill me because they know how to, they don't do the can, they just do the beans. The problem is how the sazon and the oil, if you say to limit or try to avoid cook, they don't know that you can cook with broth, with water. Mm -hmm. Those are the things, small steps, that I think you were, you were saying. But again, uh, they have it. They know that be, they've been raised on rice and beans. So you don't have to teach a Dominican how to eat, you know, rice and beans. Yeah. 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 <laughs> all right. I, I have to give all of our folks credit. They've been very timely. So we have time for questions. <laughs> so if you have a question, raise your hand. We'll get you a mic. And uh, there's someone over here on the left, someone in the middle of the center. Oh, good question. afternoon. I'm Gail Stanback. I'm a DRPH student. I've just completed my dissertation um, on the culture um, of diabetes and the black church and working um, with motivational interviewing. I, after sitting down with the focus group that um, I worked with, with my research, I found that um, there is not a lot of access to fresh foods. And I just wanted to point out that when I was educated here, in the public school system in Brooklyn back in the 60s and the 70s, even though I'm dating myself, that I received home economics in school. I learned how to cook and do all of those things. A lot of the people today are not cooking and they're relying on restaurants and other people to cook their foods. And that's where the danger comes in. And also I just wanted to point out is my grandparents had a farm back in North Carolina where we, they grew their own vegetables, their own chickens, and they did everything else. And a lot of the laws restricted um, those people who owned those properties to farm their own foods and grow their own vegetables. Mm -hmm. So this type of, those are the type of things that have created this, this issue. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that African Americans are against plant-based foods. Mm -hmm. I think African Americans cannot access plant-based foods and they've been taught not to cook and rely on processed foods. I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you. So, Marilise, I think that plays into the, the food apartheid concept. So do you have any few seconds of thoughts on that? Or? Uh, no, that, that's, that's definitely, thank you for sharing, um, Gail. And yeah, that, that it's a systematic, it's a systematic issue, right? Like that black um, farmers have been stripped away from their land. Um, like that is something that um, with, within this book uh, that Leah Penniman wrote, Farming Wild Black, she talks about that. That there are many, um, like the connection that black Americans have when it comes to the land, African Americans specifically, it's like something that is, a re there's so much inherited trauma in there that needs to be a lot of healing that needs to be done so it, it is something that the fact that uh, black folks don't have access to land here as well to grow your own foods that does create that level of barrier um, for us to be able to live um, healthier lives and, and not be at risk of all these like diet related conditions um, who has the next the mic for the next question Hi, right, Afia Bediako. I, I work for the New York, New York City in an employee wellness program with a lens on food. And also, try not, I have a lot of passion about this too, specifically around community food. And mm -hmm. um, you, you spoke on Mawali about uh, innovating. And I think that mm -hmm. well, sometimes we have to replicate because we've, we've done this. We can do mm -hmm. this. And it's not just innovating, it's replicating. But my question, rice and beans got me started on it. And I wanted to ask, um, so, and, and, and the conversation about land and 
this, this history and these problems and um, maybe immigrants and maybe even people in this country, there's a disconnection with some of uh, these kinds of foods because there's a poor people food association. Mm. So mm -hmm. um, the KFC that's in Puerto Rico that might be contributing to you know, overweight as opposed to the rice and beans. Um, the rice and beans also, just rice and beans, which is plant-based and with a vegetable, mm -hmm. you know, a healthy meal, a complete meal, a complete protein there. But there's a disassociation because we, some people think of this as poor people's food. And I just want you to speak about that, like because we're living this standard American diet, specifically for immigrants, this dream that's killing us and has been. So just kind of want to speak so, on, on Wally, that disassociation. Wally, can you respond to that, please? Yeah. Well, uh, I, I definitely feel, uh, I agree, you know, 100% that uh, I think what we tend to do is, uh, this is a misconception that uh, veganism is kind of like first world, but like rice, you know, beans, and, you know, a lot of the greens, you know, a lot cheaper, <laughs> you know, than meat. Uh, and, and, and also, and you could find that out by going to these so-called third world countries and see what the food that they have to rely on, that it's not meat. You know, like they'll eat meat at a, a, a ceremony, uh, you know, a festival or something like that. You know, they'll be, you know, happy to, you know, finally get access to meat. But, you know, we're eating, you know, that, that plant-based food. Um, they're eating that plant-based food on a, a consistent basis, and our community just really, you, you're right. Um, I think the innovative uh, methods are more in organizing and, and, and attracting people, but you're right, uh, it, it, it is something that we have right now. We just kind of, you know, have to, you know, tap into and, and you know, and wake up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think there's someone in the back, yes. Hi, uh, my name is Donna. I am a community health education major at your college. And one of the things that um, we had to do a research for, and it came up about accessibility to foods. And one of the things that I never knew about is that the New York Department of Health has an initiative that says NYC green cards. And for anyone who is familiar with those green cards, you know exactly which neighborhoods they're in. They're supposed to be in the neighborhood that don't have access mm -hmm. to foods and stuff. So what can you guys, you know, how can we get um, the green cards in our neighborhood? Because I remember working in Manhattan, Upper East Side Manhattan, and that is where I saw them. I didn't see them in my neighborhood. I live in Bedford-Stuyvesant now. There's one on North Shore and Fulton. That's the only one that's in bed -Stuy right now. So I just want to know, you know, if any of you can answer, how can we get the green cards more accessible to our people in our neighborhood? Well, uh, Diego or if someone else has particular no, the, My expertise? only comment that I can do is that for, I, I remember before I started, you know, this project, uh, we used to have it in the drawer, and we were not giving, at least, you know, in the neighborhoods that we were. So many times they're there, and people just don't take advantage. So a lot of resources, I mean, the Bronx, Manhattan, they have, you know, markets, there's great, but I don't think we are using, uh, I agree, there's, to me, it's not that people actually don't know these resources. Uh, that's, that's my, at least in my clinic, that's how I see it. If, if I may, um, I think it is, you know, he hit it right on the, you know, on the head. We just don't know about it. I, uh, I, I happen to know about it because I was working with Green Market, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and in the Bronx, where you, there's a less um, access, you know, uh, to fresh produce more than any other borough. And so when I, you know, got back to Brooklyn, like, I was not hearing about green, you know, green cards at all. Uh, so uh, that's the first thing, but then I, and then I think people will assume that you know, maybe you know some of these communities don't want to operate a green card because you have to be in those communities as well, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so there are some prerequisites as well, um, but I don't think I just don't I don't think that the information is getting out there to the people. I think that people, we have to be careful that when we see commercials and stuff like that at KFC, McDonald's, and Burger King, we don't think that anybody's trying to beat us over the head, but somebody talk to you about rice and beans and veganism, like people would be like, oh my God, I can't believe it. You know? <laughs> like you just saw like 100,000 commercials already, you know, today, you know, you see billboards, you know, that's more money. And if you, if you just, you know, just compared the, you know, the dollars, you know, how many dollars are we putting into, you know, just the access to information about fruits and vegetables and what we can do? And then how much are, 
these um, fast food establishments, you know, putting in, you know, um, the McDonald's alone is like a billion dollars. And then I think the, the, the government, um, last time I, you know, I heard was less than $2 million in terms of access to fruits and vegetables. All right, we have time for one last quick question. Monica? My last quick question after a comment. First, I thank the panel for all that I heard. I missed a little bit of Chef Adewale's um, comments in the beginning. But has anybody made the link between all the social conditions that people experience that drives them to food? I mean, we even have the language comfort food. Mm -hmm. And we know that when people are upset and depressed and sometimes broke and don't have money for the foods that you spend a lot of money for that are the healthiest. So have we made the dotted lines to all of the reasons that people eat, including starting with being upset and anxious and depressed and a lot of that coming from racism. You did use the word apartheid. I appreciated that. So could you just draw a lot, some lines to why people eat? Today we ate because the food was delicious, but there are other times when people eat and drink and smoke and use drugs for other reasons, and we need to try and connect that intersectionality so that we can understand mm -hmm. how we need to approach this from a lot of different angles. Thank you. So I'm going to ask Marilise because she's a chef, an organizer, an educator, and has lots of intersectionality. So I mean, I you can, can we can maybe answer co-answer this okay. one. Okay. Yeah. Just we, we need to be brief I'll now go, and tie yeah, up. I'll go, I'll go very fast, and I, I want to give you a little bit of hope. I cannot talk. We don't have time to talk about emotional eating. But what I can tell you is that Dr. Esselstyn says usually in his talks, we need to change good food that we like, which we know there's. We like it, you know, all the junk food and it's comfort too. Food that we can eat and it's also, com so the starch, the most number one reason for people failing plant-based, they want to eat, doctor, I'm doing perfectly fine. It's the third day on green salads. You know you're not gonna sustain, it's unable, you're, not, you're unable to sustain. So if you don't add your corn, your potatoes, your rice, that's to me is comfort food. So change one comfort food for another. That's, that's my take. Yeah, I'll add to that, too, that when it comes to, for example, sugar, sugar, you know, there has been studies that say that sugar is just as addicting as cocaine. Um, it, it's a real thing, like processed sugars, refined sugars, you do have, like, this desire to want to eat more and more and more. So it, it's... I think it's also like sharing that knowledge with, um, with our people, with our communities. Um, I mean, sharing it is one thing, but also letting them know like this is really, uh, it, it is detrimental to our health. It, it, it is causing so much harm, sugar. Um, so I think it's also acknowledging that and looking for natural like al alternatives to that. Let's have a fruit. Like if you have that sugar craving, because that's, that's very common. You're like, oh, I want, I'm craving something sweet. All right, let's make Maybe eat dates or maybe have some dried fruits or have um, an apple like find these other substitutes that can help with that that sugar craving um, yeah sometimes you may want to have a cookie but I think it's also in moderation um, is what's really important uh, and and just kind of reminding yourself psychologically like okay I want this but is this really good for me right now so it's a lot of like mental work that you need when it comes to food that you you have this like psychologically it's like every time I'm angry I have a bag of chips but it's like all right maybe I should take a walk like just kind of reflecting on that and of what it and 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 what I I know people that have shared like maybe having a diet diary and like you know um, some community chefs are are talking of incorporating that in their in their programming of like just writing things that you eat and how do you feel Thank when you. you eat these things so thanks so uh, to tie it up I would I would ask you to if you go to our website that's downstate.edu slash plant based there is a, a section on the upper left that says a beginner's guide to plant-based nutrition. And you will find in the back of that guide a list of about 50 green markets and places you can access fresh food in Brooklyn. Um, it's a very comprehensive list, so look there. I, I really want to thank our three panelists who, as you can see, are completely passionless. Um, but they did a good job pretending. And some great insights, wisdom, knowledge. Omawale has apparently the final word, so go ahead. <laughs> 
really quickly, uh, we're going to have Black Veg Fest Co-op City uh, April 13th. The community had called on us, and uh, we already had to expand that space. So if people are interested in going to Co-op City, where it's kind of landlocked and away from other neighborhoods and access to resources, we're going to come and, and bring folks who have that information, who have the resources. So Sounds April good. 13th. Go to blackvegfest.org. It's we'll free. We'll all gather there. It's free. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists. And I will invite up Ra Rachel Atchison from our Brooklyn Borough President's Office to be the anchor session. So what a pleasant way to end National Women's History Month with a Power Woman panel. So uh, I would love uh, to start out the panel if you each could uh, give us an overview of your work and a background. Ruth, let's start with you. Um, my name is Ruth Stanislaus. I'm the founding principal of PS971, which is located in uh, Bay Ridge Sunset Park um, in Brooklyn. We're a K-5 school. Um, I founded the school, I wrote the proposal, and it was accepted. Uh, this is my ninth year being principal, 27 years in education. Um, and so just a little bit about my background with eating healthy and plant-based foods. Um, we are one of four vegetarian schools in the city. In fact, there's only four in the city. Um, and we recently became vegetarian um, about two years ago. When I first opened the school, uh, I knew that we wanted to um, focus on healthy living. Our school is called Math, Science, and Healthy Living. Um, and so we took a whole child approach um, to not only look at students academically, um, socially, and emotionally, but physically and nutritionally also. Um, so we started off with an alternate menu, which the Department of Education um, provides for everybody, which uh, has some plant-based meals, but there's also a little bit of meat. And then about two years ago, um, under the guidance of the Coalition for um, Healthy School Foods, uh, we worked with them a lot. We decided to go full vegetarian, um, and that's where we are now. That's awesome. Go for it. Hi, I'm Leanna Levine Reisner. I am a mom of three kids, and my health story involves reversing endometriosis with a whole food plant-based diet. Um, and I was really spurred into this by my own family's need for health. And once I started getting into the literature and learning more about it, I realized there was a whole movement out there behind this kind of message. And so um, I decided to take on leadership within Manhattan to try to bring awareness and support to people about whole food plant-based nutrition. And there were some other lovely people working in the Bronx, in Queens, in Staten Island, Long Island, who were doing the same. And just earlier this month, we relaunched all together, sort of under the same brand as Plant Powered Metro New York. And our vision is to take the movement that's already begun internationally and especially nationally and to give it more fuel. So we have folks on the ground who are our messengers, if you will, who have been personally changed by plant based nutrition and are trying to connect in whatever ways we can with local communities to bring this message out in many different ways. So Ruth, and so Ruth, I'll start with you. You say we're one of four vegetarian schools as if it might have been easy to become a vegetarian school, but I'm sure there were barriers to that institutional change. Can you go over what some of the barriers were? Was there anything cost-wise, parents? Um, um, coming from the cost-wise aspect, you know, we're a public school, so there's nothing um, that impacts our school from a, a budgetary um, um, aspect. Um, but because the, the Department of Education, the Office of um, School Foods and Nutrition, they take care of us. So kids in public school, they eat free. They have free breakfast. They have free lunch. Um, but one of the barriers that we really had to overcome was our demographics and then looking at what do kids eat when they go home to their families and just in the community in general? So my school is located in a community where I have 55% Asian um, Pacific Islander students, um, mainly from China, and 39% Latino students um, from Mexico and Ecuador and many Latin countries. And so one of the barriers was really looking at the staples in the home of, you know, of the kids that come from the community like that. So 
in our Chinese community, they're very heavy into pork. Um, and in our Latin community, they're very heavy into meat. So when we approach the parents, um, we, we ask them, you know, what do you think about plant-based foods? And so many parents were like, oh no, our kids need meat because of the protein. Um, so then it was really up to us to do a lot of the research so that we can show parents. Um, we can show them, look at the statistics. So that basically meant having meetings with parents, going to our PTA. Um, we have family night dinners where we have staff members that actually cook for our parents. It's sort of like a, um, a, a like chopped type of show, but the parents are actually cooking. Um, we have, um, we've connected with um, our Brooklyn Borough President, um, Eric Adams' office. He's uh, come in and he's spoken to our staff members. Um, and we've linked up with the Coalition for Healthy School Foods. They actually come in and do lessons for our students twice a week um, about plant-based foods. We show our students what it looks like before it's cooked. Um, and then at lunchtime, they'll actually see it on the menu. So we do all of this with the hopes that when the kids go home, they can actually talk to their parents about some of the foods that they've been eating all day. Um, and then their parents will question them and say, okay, how'd it taste? Um, so it was just really the barriers was just trying to get through to the parents, but through the students um, and through meetings and just different things like that, we were able to get through to them. And you said it's been, uh, you've been vegetarian for two years now. Yeah. Was it difficult, how much more difficult was it year one versus year two, or did you have the same sort of obstacles year two? Um, I mean, I don't, I didn't really view them as obstacles. I just viewed them as, okay, you need to know the information. And so to me, the best way to, to get people to know about different things is to provide them with the information. Because you can't just assume that, you know, oh, look, I'm vegetarian, don't you wanna be? Because the, the first question that they'll have is, well, why should I be vegetarian? What is it doing for me? So once we just started providing with them with statistics um, about childhood obesity, um, about early onset of heart disease in children, which they really didn't know about, and about the benefits of plant-based foods, then they were more open to it because who doesn't want their kids to be healthy? So we, we kind of took, you know, took it from that way to say, you know, you want your kids to be healthy. Like it's not just an academic um, piece here in school. It's they're here and they have two out of three meals with us. And so this is how we're providing the healthy foods for them. Don't you want to try this at home? And I know students have, students and children have a role to play in your theory of change as plant-powered Metro New York. Um, can you elaborate on what y'all's theory of change looks like? Sure, so I know that Daniel was mentioning this about the idea behind psychology is very theory-based. And um, I think it's also really important in the nonprofit world when you're trying to create a change out in the world that you have a theory of change and you understand what you're trying to get at. So for us, um, going back to your question about should we inspire people with the, some of the fear, um, my training is in organizational psychology uh, and positive psychology. And so I like to start from a place of opportunity and appreciation because there is an incredibly positive message about the power of plant-based nutrition. And if we bring it to people and meet them where they are with that message, um, it actually has the capacity to sort of open, open the brain. Um, and there's been research on, on um, the brain and on behavior that shows that this is the be a better way of approaching people and helping them to make changes. Um, but to really get to it, first of all, you need to talk about who are, who are we going to. Well, we need to find people who are open to change. Some of those people are people who are already hurting. They're sick. They're tired of where they are. They don't trust their doctors anymore. Um, they might be really stuck. Other people are caring for people. For me, it was caring for my kids and worrying about their health. For other people, you're caring for your parents. Um, all of these situations put us in a prime position to be open to the idea that there is something different than what mainstream medicine is telling us. Um, and then the theory goes into, well, what are you, you going to do to get people to actually think about changing their habits? Um, first, I think, is using stories. Um, when we hear the story of the Brooklyn Borough President, we all say, oh my God. <laughs> um, if I were to sit here and tell you a little bit more about mine, if my friend Enrica would tell you her story of healing from colitis, et cetera, et cetera, we would all be in a room full of 
um, of motivation because that's where it comes from, these narratives. The science will tell us a lot, but it doesn't tell us quite as much as the stories do. So the repeated exposure to stories, I think, is a key piece of our theory of change. Um, the second piece is trusting relationships. Um, we have to have a relationship with somebody who has made a change in order to even see the possibility for ourselves sometimes, or to trust in the people who are giving the message to us. And right now, it's not easy to trust people who are telling you this diet or that diet. Um, so getting through to that trust is important, and I think that's the role that our empowered leaders sh can have in community. If somebody's out there trying to talk to a church or talk to a school about the power of plant-based nutrition and why it will be effective in those communities, um, we're talking about building trust first and then creating supportive relationships as the next step for when people are ready to change their diets. And then the third piece of the theory is around um, providing sufficient instruction for people so that they feel that the change is achievable. Um, in a way, this is the rewiring of the synapses that the Brooklyn Borough President was talking about. We have to show them that it's possible and that you can relearn behaviors. And uh, Ruth, I kind of diving a little bit into the institution of DOE, what is your relationship with the Office of School Food? What is, uh, how does one become a vegetarian school? I mean, do you have to do a survey? Do you have to send home letters to parents? How does that process look? Um, well, it's the Department of Ed, so within the Department of Ed, there are a lot of things that are already set in place, but there are four of us. Well, there were three of us before I joined. And so just knowing that there, were, there was at least one school out there, there happens to be three, um, was a little, made it a little bit easier because then you know, I said, okay, well, I'm not going to be the only one. Um, and so then it was a matter of just connecting with the Office of School Foods, um, which is in Long Island City, and trying to set up meetings where they would actually come to my school and see what we have here and see who our kids are. Um, and then sort of working with them, holding them accountable, but working with them with the vision that we had. Um, and then also pulling in the other schools to say, look, there are four of us here. This could be a growing movement here. And then once we connected with the borough president's office, you know, it was like a go because he, um, he's focusing on Meatless Mondays, which the Department of Ed is now um, adopting as a, you know, a part of a, the school food system that all school, schools may be, have meatless Mondays now. So in our eyes, we're sort of a little ways there, but we just chose to go the full way. Um, but working with the Department of Ed, we, we get support from them. Um, you know, we've been working on looking at various menus. Like my students went on a field trip to Long Island City to do a taste testing um, to see, okay, can we have another menu item on our menu? Um, it's a little difficult because with the Office of um, Food and Nutrition, you really have to deal with the finance part um, that we don't really participate in. But as we know, to eat well, it costs, right? So yeah, it also costs in the Department of Education too. Um, so sometimes that's a little barrier, but you know, it's a slow progress, but it's progress. So that's how we're sort of looking at our relationship with the Department of Ed. Like we're making baby steps with them. And so to speak to the allies portion, I know your group has had a lot of success gaining allies. And your group started, what, a year ago-ish? In Manhattan, yeah. And now you all are just dynamite. You're everywhere, and it's amazing. Uh, so how have you built up allies? Who have some of those allies been? Sure. So I, the way that we operate is as a network. So our idea is that there are people all over the metro area who know about this information. And if we can connect everybody and give them strength and a common brand and a unified message, then we will have more credibility in the field for folks to see us and say, oh, maybe I should consider that when I'm thinking about my health. So that's one piece of it. Um, the, in, in our base building work that has been going on over the past year and more, or more, for um, we have organizers in the Bronx and Long Island that have been around for longer, um, a lot of this is about uh, building the relationships and then elevating new leaders. And so um, we try to give people a role at, by saying, look, we are all connected to institutions that have the possibility of changing with our intervention. So what can we do to provide support to these people um, so that they feel that they have um, 
you know, the backing to go in and, and offer a different solution to their institution. Um, for me, I, you know, I'm in the Upper West Side. I decided to go to the wellness center in my neighborhood, which is the JCC, a Jewish community center. And I knocked on the door of the senior director of health and wellness programming and said, could you do some plant-based programming? And after some conversations where I wasn't sure if it was going anywhere, we ended up creating a whole series of plant-based um, educational programs that began just this past January and are continuing for as many months as, as, uh, as they want. They're really very interested. And it also led to us creating our own Jumpstart program at the JCC in February, where we got a group of 21 people together to do a deep dive immersion into whole food plant-based nutrition with the before and after biometrics, like the kind that Dr. Ponyman was talking about. So that just happened by one person knocking on the door of somebody with influence in an institution. My friend Enrica went to a church in her neighborhood in Astoria and found, after talking to three other churches, finally found a, a, a priest who was interested in hearing her message and was able to go and speak to the seniors there at their weekly meeting and now we'll have more of a presence there as the months go on uh, because people are genuinely interested in this topic. We have someone out in the Bronx who um, found a dietitian at the ShopRite in his neighborhood who knew about plant-based nutrition but hadn't really done anything with it in her work and by going and encouraging her to do something now she does monthly whole food plant-based food demonstrations and then she also has created a flyer for shoppers so that they can find whole food plant-based um, uh, ingredients and supplies in the store. Um, and then on the government level, uh, showing up, being present, um, testifying when there's opportunities to comment on banning processed meats in schools, or um, uh, down in Staten Island, uh, one of the organizers, Natasha, she has been sitting at the table with their uh, government leadership and their bur uh, borough president trying to get this on the agenda. And having more people getting this on the agenda is what this movement is all about. And that's a very uh, cool shout out because I believe we have a contingent of four people from the Staten Island Borough President's <laughs> Office here. So uh, very exciting that, yes, being at the table and showing up definitely uh, begins that conversation. So I know we have a lot of different people in this audience who are coming from a lot of different sectors. We've got some folks from YMCA. I know some Seventh-day Adventists. We've got Department of Health, Department of Education. If you were to give kind of a broad sweeping advice to how does one move the needle within their institution? What would you say? So if you were to have one or two minute pitch about that, and Leanna, let's start with you. Sure, um, there's a lot I could say here. So um, one is if you need support, Plant Powered Metro New York is here for you. Um, I think we all need to know that we're not acting as individuals. We are part of a broader movement. And when you have that support, and sometimes the brand, and maybe even an expert in the room next to you when you're going and talking to somebody, uh, that's the kind of role that we would hope to play to help people take an action rather than feel scared about taking an action. Um, the second is to have your talking points and materials, things that you can share that sh show the evidence. I love the SUNY Downstate materials because they're really solid, scientifically based. Um, materials that people can take for, the, for those who need it. Some communities really want the evidence, others just want the stories, and it really depends on so the demographic that you're working with. Um, the other thing is to find a partner and not to do it alone. When you have a bunch of parents or a bunch of teachers or a school principal who are interested in this and you can bring those people together, that's so much better than just being your own individual person. Um, and I think also um, knowing what your next steps are, being able to plan out, okay, if I do this, what, do I, what am I really asking for when I go to a leader? And it, how am I gonna follow up with them? What do I have the time for? And, and where is uh, this person's motivation and interest? And how can I follow them where they are? And I think just to add on to um, what you were saying before, you know, coming from a public school setting is to really find out how can we uh, more or less take the interests of our students because they are the ones that will actually spread the word without any questions. <laughs> so when they go home to parents, you know, they are the ones that, again, that will insist on, no, I want to eat this and I want to eat that. Um, and just connecting with their parents. Um, so if you're in a public school, there are four of us, and you're welcome to come and visit me anytime <laughs> to see how we do it. Wonderful. Thank you both so much. Um, <laughs> We have time for uh, about five questions. So anyone in the audience, if you raise your hand. Ginny, let's start with you. And if we're having problems with mics. Uh, I can speak louder. 
Yeah, you can speak loudly. Go for it. And thank you for that uh, wonderful panel. I appreciate it. This question is actually for Ruth. Um, Rachel knows I do a lot of work with schools. Um, I think that's wonderful. I mean, absolutely amazing that you've been able to go uh, vegetarian. Uh, my question to you is, um, have you seen any, A, um, reduction in the number of children that access perhaps the lunch program, or is it more? And then the other thing is that, have you seen any difference in academics or behavior or any other changes in the school environment as far as the children once you went, went vegetarian? Um, I mean, just really going, focusing on our data, like w this is just our second year in, so you know, looking at our data, we wanted to give it a little bit more time um, to actually see the change. We did, we did um, grow in our ELA and, and math state scores since last year. Um, I don't know if that's you know, because of the food that all the kids are eating, now eating. Um, but I think what we're doing is we have a, a three to five year plan to just quick, uh, keep collecting data. Um, our numbers of students that eat school foods did not fall off. Um, and just really you know, keep collecting our data for uh, the next couple of years and then we'll be able to look at the trends um, and compare it to academics. Are you growing some of your food that you're incorporating into the? Um, yeah, we're actually a sustainability school. We're a green school, so we, we do all of that. We have um, a green team um, that goes around and, and we recycle and they go around and check all the classrooms. We have a garden outside in our schoolyard that we work with um, our science teacher. Um, we're a sustainability school, which means that we look at composting, um, we look at growing healthy foods, we look at um, um, how we can keep the environment green so our school is healthy living. So a lot of things that we do in the building really zoom into that. Um, so everything sort of falls into you know, one whole thing of who are we going to be in 10 years as humans in this world and how can we change right now so that when we get there, we can actually change the world. Thank you, I'd love to visit. I'm gonna come with Rachel. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Can speak loud, and I can repeat the question. Uh, Leanna, uh, you talked about the power of stories. Uh, I know you have a Facebook page. Uh, what do you have in place? Sorry. Hero, thank you. Uh, so, a place where people could post their stories. Uh, when we have events at Long in Long Island, you have maybe one or two people who will speak to an audience. But with the website, with the Facebook page, uh, you have an opportunity for a lot more people to contribute their, their stories. Mm -hmm. And do you have anything that you're creating that is like that? Yeah, not formally right now. There is actually a wonderful, so you know the national organization Forks Over Knives that's behind mm -hmm. the movie, um, they put out these testimonials on a periodic basis of people who have made really dramatic improvements when adopting a whole food plant-based diet. And the stories that they've collected are really incredible. Um, what I would love to do is to have more of our members be able to sh feel open to sharing their stories through social media. And it would be great to create some kind of social media campaign around that. Thank you. Yes. Hi. I'm curious to know, uh, for those parents who are between the ages of approximately, I guess in high school, up to 30, how receptive are they to plant-based eating for their kids? Um, repeat, sorry, repeat the question? So in between, for parents who are between the ages of approximately, I guess starting from like high school up until 30, um, how receptive have you guys seen um, their kids be to plant-based eating? Is that too? Oh, uh, I'm sorry, I really uh, That's for, for both how, of like, how, any how of you guys. How receptive have you seen parents be to their kids? So, for instance, if their kid goes vegetarian and ve right. vegan? Right, correct. 
Um, I mean, my school goes from K to five, so mm -hmm. you know, my older students are 10 and 11. Um, I think the parents are very, very receptive um, to what, they, what their uh, children are eating because um, you know, if it's healthy, I don't know a parent that wouldn't want their child to eat healthy. Um, I think sometimes we sort of fall into um, the realm of the kids not necessarily liking the food. Um, and so my next step as a school is to uh, really try to connect with the Office of Food and Nutrition to talk about what are the actual um, items on the menu that you can sort of draw kids into. Um, we're really competing with McDonald's and Burger King and places like that. But then my idea is, well, um, you know, kids are visual. Why couldn't we have veggie burgers and veggie nuggets? Because they, they just look at it and they'll say, oh, wow, we got nuggets. But they're not really saying, OK, well, what is this nugget made out of? You know, so that they just know that we have nuggets. So as a school, my next step then is to really try to zoom in on how can we change some of the items that we have um, on the menu. The items that we have on the menu, I mean, I love them as an, as, as an adult. You know, we have black bean quesadillas, we have um, um, zucchini, we have um, um, bean tacos, you know, delicious. But then I'm not a fourth grader, you know, that just spent the weekend at McDonald's with their parents. But, so I think um, our next step is to look at the items. I'll also say, I speak mostly from my own experience. In our, in our group, in the base building work that we've done so far, I have not found so many parents who are aware of and actively implementing a whole food plant-based diet with their children. And the ones who I have found are struggling with it because, gosh, our society makes it so hard. Um, and so when I'm thinking about my experience with um, you know, my kids, who are all their age eight and younger, um, I've, I'm in the Jewish community, and in the Jewish community, there's definitely uh, uh, the omnivorous diet is is the default, but there are plenty of vegetarians, and I think um, most of the time I don't hear anybody talking about um, what kind of diet is the healthiest diet. People just are sort of going with the mainstream recommendations on food. Um, I would, I, but every parent says they want their kid to eat healthy, but at some point they throw up their hands. Once they're past the toddler phase and the kids sort of are more in the, in the driver's seat, um, it's a lot harder to control what your children eat. And unless you create the safe haven in your home, it's nearly impossible. So I think one of the things that we would like to do if we can get through to parents is to be able to say, look, you are in control of what's in your home. And if you can do this, then your children can do this. And we have to be partners to create healthy children because they're the ones who are going to suffer the most and who are already suffering the most, as Dr. Katz showed, by sort of generational trauma that's been um, passed to us from decades of poor eating. And to uh, elaborate on something that's happening locally, the New York City Healthy School Food Alliance is a parent-led organization. It's kind of a grassroots movement right now that has teamed up with Borough Hall as well as uh, with other educators. And they are having, they're hosting a rally in March around healthy eating sometime in June. So definitely try and uh, Google the NYC Healthy School Food Alliance. Definitely someone to have on your radar. And to your point of, of how do we maybe switch out some of these products. I was just alerted yesterday that there is a pilot project, very exciting pilot project going on in a hospital system down in Florida, about 11 chain hospitals, um, who have switched out all of their meat products for the vegetarian alternative. And they're doing a pilot right now. There'll probably be some groundbreaking news in this world if, if it is successful and if they sign that contract. Um, but it's exciting to see some of these alternatives really give right. birth. Well, we've already begun with the meatless Mondays yeah so that's the first mm -hmm. that's the first step so and we have time for one last question so in the back hi I'm a culinary um, educator and I have a few um, I guess answers or comments for the high school someone asked about the parents being receptive when they're in high school um, for me, I've noticed when you teach the high school students mm -hmm. about food, their parents are the ones that are then putting these items that you're showing them about on their, their menus or going to the supermarket. It then becomes a family activity. For someone else, a while ago, you asked about um, in 
food deserts providing food, although we have the food carts. What I've done with the school that I work in, I actually reached out to the farmer's market. I turned it into a day. So in between the time that you would drop your child off or pick them up, the farm stand would be available for you. So a part of your day, dropping off your child, then turns that into dinner or lunch or a learning experience. And they lack awareness and food education. That's what we're here for. So I, these are just, um, I guess, comments or solutions. <laughs> so with that, do you all have any closing comments? Um, I mean, I know that uh, I just want everyone to know that the work is always going to be hard, you know, until it becomes systematic um, within our environment, within our communities that uh, more or less like the table will flip where you'll see, instead of McDonald's and Burger King, you'll see the healthy places and not many Burger Kings and McDonald's left. And then everyone, um, everyone will, it would be an automatic to just eat healthy. So, um, but it's a slow process to get there. And so we just really have to look at the small inroads that we're making every day. So in my school, it's when kids come in and, and on the uh, morning announcement, you know, they're always saying, what do we have for lunch? Like, I have my little kindergartners and saying, you know, and today's delicious lunch is, you know, roasted zucchini. And, or, you know, they'll say, um, you know, a wellness tip. You know, like, make sure that you read the labels on the back of your foods to see what they have in it. So it's just little tiny things like that that you introduce to your kids every single day, and it's consistent. So like you were saying, as they grow up or they go home and they talk to they, their parents, they'll go you know, into the refrigerators and they'll look at the label and they'll say, hey mom, what is this? But that's because they learned it in school. So it's not you know, a huge thing, but it's like the little things that kids pick up every day. Um, so I always like to end the events that I run by asking people what your next step is. <laughs> what are you gonna do next with this information? Um, set a goal. We are all each important players and we each have power in our own ways. So if culture is the spoon, as Dr. Katz said, how are you going to feed somebody? Um, and I welcome anyone who's interested to join our network and become a part of this movement locally. So with the school that has the uh, phrase healthy living in its name and with a, non, a, a group who has plant powered in its name, I salute you both. Uh, thank thank you. you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you all for sticking around. You're the stalwarts, we appreciate it. So uh, we're gonna conclude now a few minutes ahead of time. But thank you for coming. I, I think this was a really special and unique event. Very diverse crew came today from all walks of life that have a stake in plant-based health and nutrition and are really going to be the movers and shakers going forward. I, I have to really deeply acknowledge Beth Helsner again, our conference chair. She really <laughs> put the proverbial, I don't know, 20 pounds of flesh into this conference. I mean, it really is. For any of you who have organized events like this, you know just, just getting all the parts together um, and getting everything approved by the borough president's office, by downstate, by the state, by this, it's a lot of fun, but I think it was worth it. For me, the big theme today, what came out of this, I think, is one word is empowerment. I, I think we can all be empowered and make change. And like most challenges in life, the solution awaits you at home, in the bathroom, when you look in the mirror. Uh, you know, where I think it was uh, Einstein who said, we cannot solve the main challenges in life at the same level we were at when we first created them. You know, so it's up to us to take control and be empowered. And I think our speaker showed us you can make change. I showed you my personal photos that I've never had up in a meeting before. I mean, we heard the borough president's story, and a few people said to me, was that photoshopped? It was not photoshopped, leave me alone, okay? Um, the borough president gave his story, I think Liana hinted at her story, and uh, there were so many stories, success stories, of people who do this and do it well, and also get their patients and, and their clients and others to 
uh, to do it. Heck, my son Daniel, who I thought gave a very nice talk, got me to go vegan, got his two brothers to go vegan. We're still working on my wife, we're getting there, but uh, little by little, and we all feel uh, great. Uh, you know, I think we've spent about a year at Downstate pushing this forward, getting the committee going, building our resources, getting the website, doing the conference, and now the pump is primed, I think, to actually make a difference uh, in the community. And we're all fortunate to be at Downstate where we work with people like the Author Ash Center, the Center for Community Health and Wellness. There's uh, Centers for Diversity and Inclusion. There's so many different groups that are out in the community doing things, even student groups. Um, I, I, are you still here, Michelle Wong? Are you, you around somewhere? No, but Downstate just formed a student group called D-I-N-E. What is that? It's the Downstate Initiative for Nutritional Empowerment. And uh, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be their faculty advisor. They've had a few meetings. They're doing great. These people are all doing great things. So keep banging the drums and, uh, you know, being empowered, empowering others. And we hope to see you at uh, future events, whether it's at the BP's office, whether it's with Plant Powered New York or, uh, or Black Veg Fest or any other thing. Uh, we're honored and privileged that you came. Um, and thank you. Have a wonderful weekend. And fill out your evaluation forms, please. So long, all.